Okay, so I accidentally hit cloud record when I was recording earlier, so that went to Dr. Rankin's account on Zoom. So I'm just going to record a quicker video of just what you will need to know for the midterm here so that you can have that and then when Dr. Rankin posts the other video, you can watch that if you're interested in any of the other stuff as well. So to reiterate, we started discussing dipterin insects last week, and those contain flies, midges, gnats, and mosquitoes. And today we'll be going over mosquitoes. And diptera is a very diverse order as we started discussing last lecture as well. They have many types of adult mouth parts, um, larval mouth parts, and the feeding strategies can be quite different as well. And so mosquitoes are another organism in this order of insects that adds to that diversity And the family Culicidae, which are the mosquitoes, and you don't need to know the family names. You just need to know the order scientific names, so Diptera for flies, and the common names. So this includes the flies, midges, and mosquitoes. And this family, however, of Culicidae, is made up of two subfamilies. The Anophilinae subfamily, which includes the Anopheles genus, and then the Culicinae subfamily, which includes Aedes, Culex, Mansonia, and all other genera of mosquitoes. Some of these can be specialists or generalists, and what that means in terms of feeding is that they feed on one host or only a couple different hosts when they're specialists, while generalists will feed on a variety of different hosts for blood feeding. Um, they are ectoparasites, and that means that they, sorry, that they feed on mostly vertebrate hosts and are outside of that host. So they're not endoparasites inside of the host. They're ectoparasites. Only females will take blood meals, and most of the mosquito species do take blood meals. We'll talk about the one exception in a moment but only females take blood meals, and they do that um, to supplement their nectar diet as well because the blood is used for egg development. And um, males only feed on nectar, but it is important to note that both males and females feed on nectar, so they are pollinators. And there are many mosquitoes that uh, pollinate rare plants. There's only a little bit of research on that. So it is likely as research continues, we will find that they are pollinating um, other important plants as well, since just a little bit of research we have shows that they are pollinating things uh, like orchids, rare orchids. And here is a video of a female sugar feeding in the lab. You can see here, she is moving her proboscis around on the apple. We used apples in the lab that I worked in uh, during my master's program to provide a sugar source as one of the sugar sources rather for the males and females. So in case you didn't believe me, here is a female feeding on that apple. For mosquito anatomy, it's important to remember that males and females look different. They are sexually dimorphic. They both have a prominent proboscis, as you can see here, but the males have these fuzzier antennae which are plumose antennae. And I also like to say that they have a hairdo. They're very fancy looking. And they're also smaller than the females, which you can see in this comparison. And the reason that the females are larger is that they need to be able to expand their abdomen and take in a blood meal and also carry a large, very large clutch of eggs. I have counted um, egg grafts as part of my thesis, and I've counted over 400 eggs per egg graft of a Culex species. So how do 
um, mosquitoes breed and where do they breed? So their larval life stage is aquatic. And for the most part, they are going to look for the stagnant water, which we unfortunately provide to them in ways of leaving out bird baths, um, other types of buckets, dog food bowls, even in toys that are out in the yard can accumulate water if they're not emptied or used often. And you'd be surprised how fast a mosquito can lay their eggs in that. And that's advantageous for them to find these types of man-made structures with temporary pools of water because they don't have predators in them for the most part, right? Most predators are gonna need um, a body of water that's been there for a while to establish. But there are still mosquitoes in natural uh, sources such as swamps and ponds and flooded areas, um, tree hole. There are mosquitoes that will lay their eggs in uh, the water, standing water tree holes, and then also in um, pitcher plants as well. And so we're gonna bust some myths about mosquitoes. Um, there are many myths and, mis myths and misconceptions about mosquitoes. Some of them are that there is no scientific evidence that eating or drinking any particular type of food like bananas or garlic can reduce the likelihood of being bitten by mosquitoes. There is no scientific evidence that taking a vitamin B or other vitamins will reduce your likelihood or lessen the severity of someone's reaction to a mosquito bite. Additionally, the blood type and skin color of a person are generally not good indicators of who is going to be more likely to be bitten by mosquitoes. What um, does increase possible uh, activity of getting mosquito bites is when you are doing some type of activity that increases your body temperature, causes you to sweat or to exhale more, such as exercise, because studies have shown that um, CO2 is the is one of the main ways that mosquitoes find us, the female mosquitoes find us, and that is also something um, that is linked to the consumption of alcohol where not the CO2 but your body temperature increases and so mosquitoes can use that heat as well to find you. So there are many ways that mosquitoes use uh, cues, chemical cues, heat or heat and um, visual cues which are not chemical to find people. So there's no one thing that you can do aside from wearing insect repellent to reduce your risk of being um, bitten by mosquitoes in addition to other things to prevent them from getting at you like wearing long sleeve shirts and things like that which we will cover in a minute. Um, and another myth that I just want to talk about is that mosquitoes cannot transmit HIV. The saliva is the only thing that is injected into humans when a mosquito bites and um, HIV positive blood is broken down in the gut of a mosquito. Unlike other mosquito-borne diseases, it's not able to replicate in the mosquito gut um, like West Nile virus can, which replicates and also gets into other body parts of the mosquito and makes its way up to its mouth parts, which is how it gets in the saliva. HIV does not do that. All right, so for the mosquito bite, it is an inflamed bump that is rather itchy, and that is an allergic reaction to the saliva that is injected by the mosquitoes during blood feeding. And the severity of your reaction is, if a reaction to the bite is going to be different depending on the person to person. For example, my nephew gets giant welts the size of like a quarter and my friend's mother growing up did not get any welts when she was bitten by a mosquito. She wasn't allergic to the saliva at all. So they vary from person to person. But what you will need to do if you do get a mosquito bite in the well is to clean and dry the bite with warm and soapy water and a clean cloth. And then you can also apply like topical medication or lotion like anti-inflammatory um, medication or antipuretics or some type of soothing substance like aloe vera, which may reduce the itchiness. 
and also using an antiseptic can uh, prevent secondary infection of the area which often comes from you scratching the area uh, because you have bacteria and stuff on your hands under your nails especially and if an infection develops you should definitely see a doctor um, for medical advice and possible antibiotics so mosquito um, bite prevention is important and um, <laughs> the mosquito populations that are going to be most likely to bite you are near breeding habitats like wetlands or flooded areas or man-made structures um, like roadside ditches and other large uh, areas with stagnant water and so it's best to avoid those areas during the times of day when mosquitoes are biting which most often is around dawn and dusk although there are some day biters which we will talk about later and we'll focus on the types of diseases that they can spread in the lectures in two weeks and as i discussed wearing long sleeves and pants is important and eliminating that standing water in around your um around residential areas. Using insect repellent, you can also use bed nets and mosquito nets or screens on your windows. And they also do sell clothing that is treated with um, insecticides like permethrin. And they also treat bed nets as well with um, similar insecticide called uh, bifrenthrin, which is uh, related to permethrin. And those are safe um, for humans, so that's why they are put on clothing and bed nets. So I mentioned before that nearly all mosquitoes blood feed. However, there is one very unique and cool species that does not, and that is the Toxorhynchites mosquito, or uh, that's the, gen the genus of this mosquito, and its common name is the elephant mosquito. So instead of blood feeding the females um, as adults, the females instead eat other larvae. So they are predatory on other mosquito larvae, which actually means that they could possibly use for biocontrol. They don't bite as adults and they only eat larvae as larvae. So they don't pose a threat to humans and actually are beneficial to us if you think about it, because they may be eating larvae of mosquitoes that trans could transmit diseases to us. And several of these species are quite beautiful. As you can see here, this species, which I think is from Indonesia, um, has these beautiful iridescent legs and wings in this purple color, and then the gold iridescent thorax. And then here is a cool video to watch that um, really shows if you look at this far right one, that the big guy is the Toxorhynchites or elephant mosquito that just got that other mosquito larvae. So they are quite large compared to most other mosquito larvae that you will see in nature. And they are highly, um, they're very good at their job. So three through, all these vials three through seven all have priority. So they, they're hungry and they're voracious and they're very large and in charge. <laughs> Um, okay, so next we're going to talk about Culex mosquitoes, which are pictured here at the bottom. Um, they are generalist feeders, and uh, several species are, so they feed on birds, mammals, and reptiles. They are disease vectors, and so they, they can spread vector uh, various forms of encephalitis and West Nile virus. And these are, uh, on the end, some photos that I took of Culex pipiens, which is a mosquito that I worked with in my master's program. So you can see here that they um, go to the surface of the water with and breathe through the siphon. And here's a close up of the siphon, um, the picture that I took from a mosquito in my lab. And then the eggs in this, in this slide here are showing that they're white, and that's only when they're first laid. And then as they get older, they sclerotize or harden up and turn this darker color. So you can see some of these um, are already turning that darker color. And so this is the distribution of Culex mosquitoes. So in the United States, we have the Culex pipiens, and they're up in the Northern United States, but they originate from Europe and were brought over here from by the settlers. 
And then we have some hybrids as well that are present in the United States between Culex pipiens and Culex quinca fasciatus, and then some hybrids elsewhere. But it's just general to know, it's good to know that they are um, most places throughout the world except for Antarctica. So, um, and like these northern parts up here, but they have spread very far as well as Aedes, um, which is a highly invasive mosquito genus. And they typically have these really pretty, what I think are pretty white, white and black spots on their bodies and their legs. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, there are a few day biting mosquito species, and these are one of them. Um, and they vector dengue and yellow fever. And um, these are invasive, as I mentioned, and they are spread, they were initially spread in the used tire trade. Um, Aedes albopictus is the, you don't need to know that name because you don't need to know species name, but just know that they were initially spread by um, human activity and that their spreading continues and they're just more, they're more highly invasive than a lot of other species. They tend to do well in a lot of different areas and so they can be found in tropical and subtropical environments, and they're on all continents except Antarctica. And so enough of these mosquitoes, their host specificity it varies, and they can be very difficult to control. They can go indoors to bite and also bite outdoors, and this is another one that they will bite during the day or the night and they are the vector of malaria and canine heartworm and other various viruses. So malaria is a huge um, disservice that they provide the communities that have these species and this uh, virus, and it kills more than half a million people every year, and those people that die are typically children under five and pregnant women. So this is a, a huge um, problem that the science community uh, really needs to work on and unfortunately we'll discuss insecticide resistance in a little bit but that is not helping with the problem. So to be able to tell Anopheles and Culex species apart we will look at their eggs. Um, so Anopheles lay single eggs in the water whereas Culex lays these egg rafts so they lay these egg clusters and the Anopheles species will get very close to the water surface and they breathe through spiracles along their abdomen while Culex pipiens breathes through, um, Culex species, um, sorry, pipiens is the one I studied, breathes through the siphon which attaches to the surface of the water. So they kind of hang down like this vertically while these guys are horizontal. And also the uh, resting position of these insects are different. So Anopheles will lift up their abdomen into the air like this, whereas Culex will be straighter and more horizontal when they're resting. Another way to tell the adults apart is to look at their palps, uh, the part of their mouth parts. So Anopheles have these very long palps on both males and females, while the mouth parts of Culex have shorter palps on males and females. And then wing spots are also present on Anopheles most often, where Culex are usually transparent. And these wing spots are created by scales, which are similar to like what butterflies have on their wings. And so that's what creates that coloration. And um, mosquitoes have lots of scales and they have them along their body as well. And so, as I mentioned before, these eggs are laid singly by Anopheles. They have the little floaty doodad on there and they lay these on the water surface like that and that's what helps them float, whereas there are no floats on each egg in the Culex egg graft, but they're all clumped together and do float on the, the top of the surface. And here's that one that I mentioned earlier. This one was broken a little bit because I was handling it, but um, all of these would have been clumped together and then the egg raft versus these single eggs. And again, as I mentioned before, the Anopheles larvae are horizontal and breathe through spiracles along their body, whereas 
QLX use a siphon, which they kind of connect up to the water surface. And so these guys all have to go to the water surface to breathe in some way, kind of like a whale or a dolphin or something like that. So, and mosquito control. So our goal is to um, find ways to control mosquitoes. And there are a couple life stages where you do this at. And the ultra low volume or cold fogging application seen here is one way to control for adult mosquitoes that are flying around. The pesticide is dispersed uh, after being pressurized and aerosolized into these very small droplets that stay in the air and float around for a little bit so they can kill the mosquitoes that are flying in the air. And it's called ultra low volume because the uh, amount of pesticide that you need for this type of application is actually a lot less because you're breaking it up into all these very small droplets than you would need for more traditional pesticide applications like spraying um, a substrate that the mosquito would lay on and that is the contact that they would get would be um, not lay on but that they would land on and so when they land on that substrate they get exposure to the pesticide that takes a lot more pesticide than the ultra low volume or the ULV application which is why this is becoming a more favored way to control mosquitoes with pesticides however mosquito um, resistance to insecticides is a huge problem and this is the basic cycle of how it happens so you have very few individuals that have the genes that provide them resistance to an insecticide initially and so then you have all these susceptible um, mosquitoes but then as they get exposure to the the insecticide you only have a couple of the susceptible or very few of the susceptible individuals surviving and the resistant um, individuals will survive of course and then the survivors reproduce and so that once rare um, gene it becomes far more common in the population because those are the only ones left not only but they're some of the only ones left to reproduce and then that process just continues to where you continue to get resistant genes being the major reproducers because they're surviving the insecticide exposure and then so they become far more common those genetic variation uh, mutations become common in the population and then you get and th that happens when you get exposure to the same insecticide over and over so a way to combat this is to uh, mix up the types of insecticides especially the modes of action which is the way that they work but you don't need to know that specifically mode of action but just know that this process is how it happens that you start out with that trait being rare in the population but then you take out all of these susceptible or many of the susceptible susceptible individuals and that once a rare trait of insecticide resistance becomes common over repeated exposure over time. And another way, um, of course, is to control the insects at the larval stage by eliminating their habitat as we discussed earlier. So getting rid of any man-made structures, um, draining water in pools that aren't being used, things like that. And so sterile male um, in, in mosquito releases are, and, and other insects, this uh, technique is used to actually in um, California with the medfly, which ended up not being um, as effective later on for reasons we're not going to go into. But the sterile insect te technique is used for mosquitoes as well. And what you do is rear um, mass quantities of mosquitoes in special facilities and then you expose when you expose the males to radiation the ionizing radiation that sterilizes them and then they are released into the wild where they will compete with the wild males that aren't sterile most likely um, the wild males that can successfully reproduce but they're taking up those females that would have reproduced with the wild males and those females are then laying infertile eggs so the eggs aren't fertilized and they have no offspring so that is one way to control for mosquitoes um, through I guess at the larval stage here where the egg laying there are no surviving there are no um, 
fertilized eggs, so they're not just not surviving, they're not there to begin with. And I'm getting ahead of myself, so that's um, one thing I'm talking about here. So you can also genetically modify the males, and you can do that by in introducing a, um, uh, blah, blah, what's it called? I'm forgetting, sorry, give me one second. <laughs> A lethal gene. So you introduce a lethal gene, which they're calling the sterility gene here, but really what it is is a lethal gene because that gets passed on um, through the males being uh, mating with the wild females. So these are the genetically modified males released into the wild. And then those fertilized eggs with that lethal gene die, the offspring die off in the larval stage so they do not survive to adulthood. So that is another way to control at the larval stage and um, you have to release the males of course into the wild and so it is actually a little bit of extra work to do both of these the SIT sterile insect technique and genetically modified males because these males do not um, reproduce themselves of course like that the gene for this the lethal gene does not get passed on because all of the offspring die and the sterile males don't get passed on because they only produce um, they don't produce any uh, uh, what's the word, viable sperm for the females, so they, those genes aren't getting passed on either. So they have to be continuously mass reared and released into the wild. So this does take quite a bit of extra effort than just uh, applying a pesticide, for example. And so um, I also want to go over the important ecological services that you will need to know that are provided by dipterin species. So as we've talked about this lecture and in the previous lecture, flies pollinate, even mosquitoes pollinate, right? So that is a, a very important um, ecological service that they provide. A lot of some flies feed on this organic matter that we don't want laying around the waste and then they excuse me, cycle those nutrients back into the environment. So they're very important for nutrient cycling. And then we've also used some um, dipterin species, right, as we talked about, to help with wound cleaning because they are <laughs> flesh-eating species, but they actually are able to uh, help like with diabetics, or I think it was one of the world wars where they were using those, these species of flies in um, during the war when they didn't have enough supplies to care for their wounded um, soldiers and the wounds weren't getting better. So then we also are able to use them as a service for crime scenes and investigating crimes because the life cycles of certain flies are very predictable and have been studied very well. So we know the time that has elapsed uh, when we can see what stage the larvae of those flies are in. So that can help us determine the time of death. However, we do have some very important disservices as we discussed as well briefly. The transmission of malaria is a very huge disservice and kills a lot of people every year, um, including other uh, diseases like dengue and yellow fever, West Nile virus, eastern equine encephalitis, and um, chikungunya. So there are a lot of diseases that these guys vector to humans that are important for public health and that is a disservice that they provide. All right, so that wraps up the lecture material. Um, we will be reviewing for the midterm tomorrow in discussion section. So please bring any questions that you have to that and thank you.